Vivek Ramaswamy is a New York Times bestseller author and an entrepreneur has founded numerous successful enterprises. He founded Rovint Sciences in 2014. The following year, he led the largest biotech IPO to date, just as he was turning 30. Successful clinical trials in multiple, FDA, uh, in in multiple disease areas and FDA approvals followed, as did the founding of other successful healthcare and many technology companies. Vivek, Vivek's voice is an essential, essential part of today's debates about the nature and future of capitalism, free speech, and identity politics. In books like Woke Inc. and most recently Nation of Victims, he has brought insightful thinking to the phenomenon we have all witnessed in American business in the past few decades, and that is the rise in prominent business leaders who have argued that it is no longer sufficient for executives to primarily focus on earning a profit. Instead, they argue, business decisions should advance a broad range of social and political causes. In addition to writing books and op-eds, as well as public speaking, this year Vivek founded Strive, an asset management firm that offers everyday Americans a way to invest in the stock market without mixing business with politics, without forcing individuals and families to adopt the divisive, divisive social and political agendas that most Americans disagree with. He's a first-generation American who grew up in the Southwest Ohio. He graduated from Harvard College and Yale Law School. We are very pleased to have him here and to learn from him tonight. Thank you. So thank you for that gracious introduction. I've really enjoyed even the, the brief conversations I've had with you over the course of the couple of hours I've been here this evening. And you know, one of the things that I gleaned from the, from the brief conversations that we had is that we, it seems we have a very intellectually diverse audience, which I appreciate immensely. I, I think we lack enough spaces in our modern public life where you can have a diverse group, an intellectually diverse group of people get together in an evening like this one to be able to still engage in respectful, open speech, debate, dialogue, and dialectic. And I miss those spaces, so I thank you for inviting me to be a small part of yours tonight. And what I'll say in kicking things off is that, and we will have some questions at the end, is that you know, your ideas aren't like your kids. You know, If a better one comes along, you can just uh, take it and claim it as your own. They're uh, closer to being more like a set of clothes. right? You can try it on. Take it off the rack, try it on. If it fits, you can keep it. And if not, you can put it back on the rack. And so what I'll ask all of you to do for the next half hour or so leading into our Q&A is to try it on like a set of clothes. And if it doesn't fit and you want a refund, <laughs> uh, I'm perfectly happy to, to, to engage in that uh, refund over the course of the Q&A. But with that proviso, then I'll be able to, uh, to, to really be able to take off the shackles in sharing I think a distinctive set of perspectives that agree or not, I hope, are useful in spawning a conversation. So, so what I'm going to talk about is the role of capitalism in a diverse democratic society. And, and as I do that, I will take you back to a moment that I remember distinctively in 1993, back when I was in second grade in Evendale, Ohio, in Southwest Ohio. I don't know. <laughs> Collected some chuckles from giving away my age, perhaps. Uh, yeah, it, was, it was in 1993. I, I, Ms. Stallworth was a teacher. I really remember the moment where I saw Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech for the first time. That was the speech where he said that I hope my four children grow up in a country where they are judged not on the color of their skin, but on the content of their character. And I'll tell you something. That dream it stuck with me. It meant something to me. Because it was the dream that allowed my parents to come to this country 40 years ago, my dad to come to this country 40 years ago and build a successful career for himself at the GE plant in Evendale, Ohio, despite the fact that he had a thick Indian accent. He still does to this day. It was the dream that allowed me to go in a single generation, from being the kid of immigrants who came to this country with almost no money, to becoming the founder of a multi-billion dollar biotech company, a company that I had the privilege of leading as a CEO for seven years. And over those seven years, worked on a range of drugs, five of which went on to become FDA-approved products today. Probably the one that I'm 
personally most proud of is an FDA-approved drug for prostate cancer. But I stepped down from my job as CEO to focus in the last couple of years on a different kind of cancer. Not a biological cancer, but a cultural cancer that I worried threatened to kill that dream that Martin Luther King had 60 years ago, that threatened to kill the dream that allowed me to achieve everything I ever had over the course of my career. And the cancer came in two parts, and I'll go through each in turn. The first is the first half of my uh, title of my first book, Woke Inc. It was a new secular philosophy, almost a secular religion in our country, that said that your identity is based on your race, your gender, and your sexual orientation, full stop. That if you're black, you're inherently disadvantaged. That if you're white, you're inherently privileged. Crucially, no matter your economic background or upbringing, your race and your gender govern who you are, and even the thoughts and ideas you're allowed to have. I'm a big believer in not putting words in the mouth of someone who disagrees with you, but to take somebody's best view from the other side at, at its own terms and take it seriously. You take the words of Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, who I respect for offering and articulating a clean statement of this worldview, when she clearly said that we, and this is her exact quote, we don't want any more black faces that don't want to be a black voice. We don't want any more brown faces that don't want to be a brown voice. And embedded in that worldview is this idea that your race is not just about, for example, your skin color, but it's also something that relates to the content of the ideas you're allowed to have. And, and we began to live in a moment where any disagreement with that set of views then came to be labeled with terms like the R word, racist. And there being no greater damnation in modern America than to be called a racist, began to silence the free exchange of ideas in our country, giving people a choice between either pledging allegiance to that new religion or being tarred with the scarlet R, we ended up with a cultural moment in our country where everyday Americans began to bend the knee. And as I shared with some of you before this event, I personally believe that the best measure of the health of any democratic society, especially American democracy, is the percentage of people who feel free to say what they actually think in public. And I think that this led to a threat to that measure of democratic health over the course of the last decade and a half. Now, over that same period of time, you had the second element of this cancer, the one that was alluded to in my introduction, which was a new trend that emerged over the exact same period, which was a trend in the business world, a trend in our economy and in commerce, which said that the role of a business in society was not just to deliver a product and a service to a customer for the pursuit of profit, but also to advance other, <coughs> potentially worthy, but other societal agendas along the way as well. Fighting climate change, systemic racism, and so on. Worthy social causes that government hadn't stepped up to the plate to address sufficiently in ways that private sector leaders had to do it instead. That is the new trend known as stakeholder capitalism, that a business must look after not just the interests of its shareholders, but also the interests of a more diverse array of so-called stakeholders. Now, I recognize uh, from some of the conversations I had, I'm speaking to a, a pretty sophisticated business audience here, at least many of you are part of that audience. So it'll be familiar to you to remember that Milton Friedman had a concern about this 40 years ago. In, actually, 50 years ago, in 1970, he wrote a famous essay in the New York Times Magazine said that the social purpose of a corporation is to pursue profit. And, and his view is that the reason this philosophy was flawed was that it would cause businesses to be less effective at making widgets for profit, which in turn reduced the size of the economic pie for everyone along the way and undermined capitalism's ability to deliver on its promise of lifting people up from poverty, capitalism being the best known system to mankind to lift people up from poverty. And I will tell you, I agree with everything he had to say. But my principal critique of stakeholder capitalism is fundamentally different than Milton Friedman's critique of stakeholder capitalism. It is not that it is simply a threat to the economic promise of capitalism itself, but more importantly, that it is equally a threat to democracy. Because what this new system demands 
is that we no longer settle our political differences in a democratic body politic through free speech and open debate in the public square as citizens where every person's voice and vote counts equally, but instead through economic force where our viewpoints are adjusted upwards or downwards by the number of dollars that we control in the marketplace. That it is not the job of a citizen to decide how to address climate change or how to address historical racial injustice, but that it is the job of a corporate executive, probably the most powerful of whom sits on Park Avenue, but in other places too, it is the job of those corporate executives and the boardrooms and the, and the institutional investors who influence those boardrooms to settle those political questions instead. And so my concern was less that this was just going to make companies less efficient, though I share that concern, but also that it was going to drain the lifeblood out of a healthy democratic body politic where everyone's voice and vote counts equally unadjusted by the number of dollars they control in the marketplace. And I further worried that it threatened democracy not just once but twice over. Because part of the promise of capitalism in a democratic body politic is not just that it provides the economic means of delivering prosperity to its citizens, but also that it gives us one of those sacred spaces that bind us together across our otherwise irresolvable divides of partisan and identity politics. The private sector providing that sanctuary that Alexis de Tocqueville described 150 years ago when he traveled this country and recognized that a diverse democracy is not supposed to stand on its own feet for more than a couple of generations. It, the laws of social nature don't permit that to happen in human history, but for the existence of what he called intermediating institutions, the kinds of institutions that provided a refuge from the otherwise inevitable human divisions in a diverse society. America was not supposed to work as a body politic, but for the existence of American capitalism, which provided the most lasting of those intermediating institutions, a place where it did not matter whether you were black or white or gay or straight or Democrat or Republican, when you came together to work and innovate together and invest together and prosper and make money together, you were not black, white, red, or blue, you were in the shared pursuit of green, back in the old sense of green, in the green sense of green pieces of paper. <laughs> this is what united an otherwise divided body politic. And so what happened over the course of the last you know, 10 to 15 years was that these two social forces, one social force in our culture that was sort of born in the academy as a way of challenging the prevailing orthodoxy, the so-called woke culture, merged with the force of stakeholder capitalism, another challenge to a prevailing Friedmanite orthodoxy, those two challenges to their respective orthodoxies merged and became the new orthodoxy. The challenge to the system over the last 15 years became the new system, demanding a new challenge to that new orthodoxy. And that's what I'll aim to deliver over the remainder of my remarks. Before I get to that, though, I do think it's important to understand the history of what it was that caused this trend, the, the trend of, of stakeholder capitalism infused with the modern philosophy of identity politics, what caused that trend to take off as precipitously as it has over the last decade and a half. And I think that story traces back to an unlikely place. It traces back to the 2008 financial crisis. It was not the single event, but I think it was probably the single most important event in explaining the one-way liftoff of this new merger of two powerful philosophies. What happened in the 2008 financial crisis, many of you will remember it well, was that the greed is good version of capitalism was indicted based on the results of, of how that story ended in the, in the climax of the 08 crisis. But even worse than that, government had to actually bail out the very capitalists who supposedly created that problem. A lot of bankers made money when times were good, the story went, there's a lot of truth to it, but they got bailed out at the public fisc when times went bad. And so as a consequence, Occupy Wall Street in late 2008 and early 2009 was on Wall Street's doorstep. I don't need to tell this audience much about the following. If you're Wall Street, Occupy Wall Street's demands are a pretty difficult pill to swallow. 
What Occupy Wall Street left wanted to do was to take money from those wealthy corporate fat cats, those financial institutions, and redistribute it, say, to poor people for the benefit of poor people. But right around that time was that birth of that new strand of the progressive movement in our country that had a slightly different theory of the case. What that new strand of the left at that time said was that, well, the real problem wasn't quite the historical concern of the progressive movement. It wasn't quite economic injustice. It wasn't quite even poverty, exactly. It was racial injustice and misogyny and bigotry and climate change. And that actually presented the opportunity of a generation for financial institutions, including those on Wall Street, including for big business in this country, to say that, OK, the Occupy Wall Street stuff is, is pretty tough. But this new woke stuff is actually pretty easy. We can applaud diversity and inclusion. We can put some token minorities on your boards. We can muse about the racially disparate impact of climate change after we fly in a private jet to Davos. It's pretty good work if you can get it. But, but effectively, the bargain was we don't quite do it for free. We effectively expect that that new progressive movement look the other way when it comes to leaving our historical power structure intact. Take the greatest opposition, defang it with a compromise. And it's basically, as I jokingly sort of tell my story in the book, is you know, the story of how a bunch of big banks got in bed with a bunch of so-called woke millennials. Together, they birth woke capitalism. But they use that to put Occupy Wall Street up for adoption. It actually worked so well for Wall Street that Silicon Valley actually started to copy the act. Early 2010, started to do about the exact same thing. What Silicon Valley realized was the old threat to big tech, the, the OG version of break up big tech, people forget, actually used to come from the Democratic Party, used to come from the progressive movement. So what they realized was, look, we can broker that bargain too. What we can say is that, look, here's the peace treaty. We will use our power the undue power that you worry about, we will lend that undue power to advance your substantive ends, take down hate speech or misinformation or whatever it is as you define it. But again, we don't quite do it for free. We effectively expect the new progressive movement to look the other way when it comes to leaving our monopoly power intact. And again, that trade worked masterfully for both sides. So this is really the story of an arranged marriage. My parents had an arranged marriage. That was one of the good ones. That, that one worked well. This, is, this, one's, this one's not so good. This is not an arranged marriage of love. It is more like mutual prostitution. It works as long as each side gets something out of the trade. And the net result of that act was the illegitimate birth of what I call the woke industrial, or more recently, ESG industrial complex, that is really a hybrid of political power and commercial power that together could do what neither a government actor nor a commercial actor could do on their own. The rest of corporate America more or less copied the act. You get to Coca-Cola issuing new statements about a voting law, Jim Crow 2.0 in Georgia, that results in the largest historical voter turnout in Georgia's state history in, uh, in the last week, teaching its employees how to be less white, their words not mine, while saying nothing about their own product's impact on the nationwide epidemic of diabetes and obesity, including in the black community, and especially in the black community that they profess to care so much about. Nike, Airbnb, the NBA, I could go on. This is the game that you all know. And, and, and I think the story takes a slightly darker turn in the last few years in particular when a new actor showed up on the scene and, and turned that bilateral arranged marriage into a three-party affair. And that is none other than the Communist Party of China. Now, I think this is a really important dimension of the story. It's under-discussed. I think it relates deeply to the asymmetric standards that the ESG movement, many of you are familiar with, will apply to companies in the West without applying those same standards to the exact same companies that the exact same funds are invested in on the, on the other side of the Pacific. But it's important to understand why. Okay? The reason it's important to understand why is that this is actually an intentional part. If it was just hypocrisy, I would not pause to comment on this about as much as I'm about to. But it's not just hypocrisy. It is the product of an intentional plan by a government on the other side of the world. 
probably our greatest geopolitical foe over the course and, and adversary over the course of the next decade. What, what China recognized was that this is actually an opportunity to achieve moral legitimacy on the global stage. If you, if you don't understand this, you gotta listen really carefully to what Xi Jinping says on a given day. Nearly every time Xi Jinping is pressed by, say, the UN or other international bodies on the Uyghur human rights crisis, for example, where there are over one million religious minorities enslaved in Shenzhen in concentration camps, subject to forced sterilization, communist indoctrination, and worse, the first thing that Xi Jinping often said in the last two years is that Black Lives Matter shows that the United States is no better. That is not an accident. If you listen to the comments of his top diplomat, Yang Jiechu, who came to the Alaska summit here in the United States just a year and a half ago, he spent his 15-minute opening statement lecturing Tony Blinken, our Secretary of State, stating that China wanted to see the US do better on human rights and that the US needs to stop slaughtering, that is his word, slaughtering black Americans. Now, this would be laughable if it were not for the fact that our own companies implicitly lend moral credibility to those claims. Take the case of Disney, for example, that will, a couple of years ago, say that it won't shoot a film in the state of Georgia if Georgia passes a new anti-abortion statute, or this year, uh, share its opinions about transgender education and gender identity education from kindergarten through second grade without saying a peep when it goes just a year ago to the Shenzhen province of China, literally ground zero of that Uyghur human rights crisis to film Mulan, not saying a thing until the very end of the movie where they finally muster up the courage, you can see in the credits to the film today, muster up the courage to say that we thank the local authorities for allowing us to film here. The very authorities that are responsible for quite possibly the largest human rights affront committed by a major nation since the Third Reich of Germany. That's Disney's behavior. Same thing with respect to LeBron James, the NBA, Nike, BlackRock, Airbnb, you name it. And, and the game, the game is played in a way that really allows China to use the new international class of moral arbiters of justice. That is, there's another problem really when companies, multinational companies based in the United States, become the self-appointed arbiters of international justice. The very people who are known to criticize injustice per the demands of the stakeholder capitalist and three-letter acronymized ESG or otherwise movement, the very people who are known to perpetually criticize injustice in the United States remain silent about the not microaggressions but actual macroaggressions in the places where they're still occurring creating a false moral equivalence between the United States and China, eroding our greatest geopolitical advantage of all. And that is not our nuclear arsenal, I will remind you. That is our moral standing on the global stage. See, China, and, and, and a close cousin, and actually an intellectual predecessor of stakeholder capitalism, was actually the philosophy of democratic capitalism, a phrase from the 1990s that many of you may remember that both the Democratic and Republican Party eagerly espoused, which believed that the United States could succeed by using capitalism as a vehicle to spread democracy to places like China. Basically, we thought we could use our money to get them to be more like us, that we could export Big Macs and Happy Meals, and somehow that was going to spread democracy to places like China. Well, what China realized was that actually they could turn that game on its head. Well, we thought we could use our money to get them to be more like us. What they realized is that they could use access to their market, their money, to get us to be more like them. Or, or even one step better, use our money to get us to be more like them. And it has worked because the number one reason companies asymmetrically criticize the alleged social injustices here in the United States while effectively justifying the actual human rights atrocities committed in China is that China builds a great Chinese wall that prevents you from entering the Chinese market if you dare to criticize the CCP, but they will roll out the red carpet if you criticize the United States. And the best analogy I give is, is the analogy to the Trojan War, the famous war between Greece and Troy, where Greece, like China, knew that it would not defeat Troy militarily, it didn't have the military strength to do it. But they knew they could potentially defeat their enemy 
by giving them the great gift that Troy could not resist. In that case, it was the beautiful Trojan horse. Troy could not resist that gift. They used that to get into Troy and burn Troy from within. And for, in the American context, from the Chinese perspective, that, gold, that Trojan horse was none other than the great gift of global capitalism itself, whose sweet taste they knew we could not resist, using not the Big Macs and Happy Meals that we sent over there, but the Nike, Nike sneakers and Disney movies that they sent back as Trojan horses to create that false moral equivalence between Chinese nihilism and American idealism. So, so I think that is how deep this problem runs. It is not just a threat to capitalism. It is a threat to democracy. I think it may be even a threat to free societies as we know it, as it's a trend that's been exploited by geopolitical actors, most importantly, the CCP. And the question is, what do we do about it? Right? I, I will remind you of a famous quote from you know, my favorite Republican, who, uh, you know, as a, um, you know, as a citizen today, think about you know, who your favorite Republican is. Actually, it turns out it was a Republican who spoke 160 years ago. It wasn't Ronald Reagan. It was Abraham Lincoln, who famously reminded his contemporaries that the dogmas of a quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. And, and my message to both the conservative movement and the liberal movement in this country is that the dogmas of 1980 are inadequate to address the unique challenges of 2022. We need new dogmas that recognize that even if in 1980 the threat to liberty and prosperity was singularly big government, that is at best half the story today. Today it is a new merger of big government and big business that together is more powerful than either one alone. And for the conservative movement in particular, though I think for liberals too, this offers a wake-up call and even new opportunities for political and cultural realignments that I think are hiding in plain sight, but that our culture could be more unified uh, if we were able to wake up to them. And part of why I talk about these issues is that I hope that it helps us wake up to those possibilities. First of those relates to, for example, taking that example of undue power and influence exercised by technology companies in the United States. The conventional wisdom, 1980s wisdom, my own libertarian instincts 10 years ago would have told me the same thing, that these are private companies that are free to decide what does and doesn't show up on their websites. This debate's, of course, back in the news with Elon Musk's acquisition of Twitter. Well, that makes sense to me as a general philosophy if these companies are actually behaving as private companies. But what we now know, and this is now no longer uh, you know, controvertible, this is no longer controversial, what we now know is that those technology companies are not behaving purely as private companies, but are working hand in glove with a ruling party in power in the United States. To me, it doesn't really matter which one it is. Ruling party in power that is using those technology companies to do through the back door what government could not accomplish through the front door under the Constitution, silencing individual critics of the government by demanding that technology companies do what government could not do when subject to constitutional constraints. So what I say is I don't care if you're a liberal or a conservative. If it is state action in disguise, sometimes you have to rhyme these things, that the Constitution still applies. If the government is going to use a private party to do through the back door what it couldn't do through the front door, if you remember the constitutional principle that said that, you know what, we have a three-part system of government, not a fourth branch in Silicon Valley on the other coast that's able to do the dirty work of the three-part system that we put into motion nearly 250 years ago. Since this is an you know, intellectual audience here, I'll, I'll go further than I might in, ordinarily in a speech here to say that we don't need new laws for this. Existing jurisprudence, constitutional jurisprudence in this co country already recognizes that plain fact. I'll give you a case, it's a case called Hansen. Dating back to my law school days here, so forgive me if, I, if I'm misquoting the case. I didn't plan to talk about it, but I'll just say a word about it. Relating to a different issue that's less politically charged in the current environment, relating to the war on drugs. Okay, so the war on drugs in this country was a big deal over the course of the last several decades. And what the government wanted to do was to be able to randomly search individual persons who were traveling between states for whether or not they had drugs on their person. Unfortunately, they couldn't do it because we have this pesky thing in our country called the Fourth Amendment. Well, what the government did is they passed a law which said that, you know what, we're not going to search and seize 
individuals for, for drugs on their person. What we're going to do is pass a law that gives railroads in this country immunity. Those are private companies. And what we'll tell those private companies is you can't be sued in court if you search your passengers or your employees. Well, what the Supreme Court said is not so fast, <laughs> because you can't use immunity to a class of private companies to intentionally do what the government could not do directly. There's, there's another case called Bantam Books, in which there was a local prosecutor who didn't like a book that a local bookseller was selling. There was a prosecutor who said that I'm going to threaten you if you don't take that book down. And so the bookseller didn't want to be get in trouble with the government. He took the book down. Well, somebody sued and said they wanted to get that book and that this wasn't the action of a private company denying him access to that book. It was the action of government because they used a threat to do it. Same thing's exactly what's happening with technology companies today. We're going to regulate you. We're going to break you up if you don't take down hate speech or misinformation as we define it. And I think it's a uniquely 20th century problem that complaining about big government fails to recognize the essence of what's actually happening today, that it's a merged threat combining corporate power and state power. I don't think this is limited to the internet. I think it is also increasingly rampant as a consequence of the confluence of the woke culture merger with stakeholder capitalism that we see it in the workplace and in the private sector as well. Rampant viewpoint-based discrimination that actually was a product of the civil rights statutes themselves. I'm gonna, I, mean, I haven't told this story before, but I'll, I'll tell it you know, tonight. I think it's an important historical story. And I'll share it tonight because I think that in the back of even the elections this week, I think there's an opportunity for bipartisan solutions to address the problem that I'm about to describe. So what happened was that you know, today, a lot of people, are, you, you read about in the news, people are fired for saying the wrong thing at work, wearing the hat of the wrong political candidate to work. Well, the surprising fact is that that's actually a consequence of the market interventions that we created 60 years ago. Because conventional wisdom will say that the market should fix these problems, 1980s style wisdom, libertarian wisdom would tell you that if a business is going to fire conservatives or liberals for no good reason over here, that's an opportunity for a different business to hire them. Instead, the market should work these things out. Well, the problem is that we don't apply that standard even-handedly. Right? We have statutes in this country that say that you can't fire somebody on account of their race, their sex, their sexual orientation, their religion, their national origin, and so on but you can fire them on account of their political beliefs. Now, the interesting thing is those are causally related to one another. Because what happened after the civil rights statutes were passed in, 1960, in the 1960s was that courts expanded those statutes quite expansively. They expanded those statutes to include so-called hostile work environment lawsuits, to say that you would be liable for a civil rights violation if you created a hostile work environment for any one of those protected classes. And one of the things that creates that hostile work environment is indeed the expression of a viewpoint that may be deemed to be hostile by a member of that protected group. So the irony is that those statutes, when expansively interpreted, created the very conditions for the rampant viewpoint-based discrimination that we see today while leaving political viewpoints actually unprotected. So again, this is not a 1980 problem, but this is a 2022 problem to say that if you can't fire somebody because they're black or gay or Muslim or white or Christian or Jewish or whatever, that you should not be able to fire someone just because they're an outspoken conservative or an outspoken liberal for that matter either. We have to apply those standards even-handedly. And the, the interesting part about this is a lot of people get worried about whether or not there's going to result in an explosion of neo-Nazis in the workforce or something like this if you protect political viewpoints. It turns out that most, many states, almost half of the states in this country, already protect political discrimination. And most of them actually happen to be so-called blue states rather than red states because they were laws passed 15 years ago when the concern was that the shoe might fit on the other foot. And so these are solutions that are neither conservative nor liberal, but enshrining political expression as a civil right might actually revive the few kinds of values that bind us together and in a way that transcend the politicization of the private sector that we've seen in the last few years as a consequence of the rise of stakeholder capitalism itself. Now, I'm generally a believer in addressing market, solution, market problems with market solutions rather than with state action. And I'm not particularly optimistic that we're going to see a bill passed in the next Congress that proposes 
to add political expression and enshrine it as a civil right alongside race, sex, or sexual orientation or religion. And the good news is I think most of these solutions can actually be addressed through the market itself if market participants are actually able to see that problem with clear eyes themselves. So that's actually what I've embarked upon. And for the next phase of my career, I've chosen to found an asset management firm called Strive that is using not state action, but actual market power to be able to compete with other market actors who are using market power to deliver a different voice and vote in corporate America's boardrooms. And, and one of the parts of the story I left out after the 2008 financial crisis is probably the single most powerful trend driving the politicization of corporate America was in fact the aggregation of capital in the hands of a shockingly, historically small, tiny group of market actors following the rise of passive indexation in the United States. So, so passive indexation was actually a good thing over the course of the last 15 years in bringing down fees for everyday individual investors, where you had a number of fund managers that said that actually we're not smart enough to pick stocks for you. Vanguard and Jack Bogle led this revolution. He said, we have no business picking your stocks. So what we'll do is we'll reduce fees, make it nearly free for you to have exposure to the stock market. But what we're going to do is we're also going to, as we've learned in the last 10 years, vote your proxies, that is your shareholder votes, and also exercise a voice on your behalf in corporate America's boardrooms. So that's a trend that led to actually three firms in the United States managing, as of earlier this year, $21 trillion. That's, for example, BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, the top three passive index fund managers that wield more capital than the US GDP as of this summer as a consequence of passive indexation. But today, using that capital to vote their shares in corporate America to advance generally one-sided political agendas that most of the ultimate owners of capital, the everyday citizens who gave them that money, most of those everyday citizens actually disagree with. And the irony of this bears special mention that the very parties who said that we're not smart enough to pick your stocks suddenly decided that they were wise enough to know how to design an entire social universe from addressing climate change to historical racial injustice. I personally think this is the largest scale fiduciary breach of the 21st century, hiding in plain sight. I think there's plenty of grounds for legal action, much of which I think we will see. But rather than either policy solutions or legal solutions, it is my hope that market solutions, like other choices in the marketplace, choices like I hope Strive and other competitors may bring to market, new voices to say that we can offer passive index funds but without politicized value, might actually solve the problem more parsimoniously than reactive political movements or legislation would in their own right. And what I'll close with is the fact that while I think that policy solutions and market solutions each have their plays, uh, the, the, the real sleeping giant <laughs> of the whole discussion is really a shift in our underlying culture. Because at the end of the day, businesses are only going to sell what consumers are willing to buy. And I think there's a whole separate discussion that maybe we can touch on in the Q&A uh, that I think is probably the most important part of the discussion is what is it about our national psyche and our culture that causes those consumers to demand that very politicized behaviors of our businesses? And, and here I speak as a member of my generation. I'm a millennial people my generation and younger, we live in a moment in our history where we are, I think quite literally, hungry for a cause. We are all hungry for a sense of purpose. We're hungry for meaning and for identity. At a point in our national history when the things that used to fill that void of purpose and meaning and identity, things like faith or patriotism or hard work or family or whatever it may be, as those things have receded in modern life, our generation and younger has a black hole of a vacuum left in its wake. And I think when you have a vacuum that runs that deep, that is when poison begins to fill the void. And I think the task ahead of us is how we're going to be able to fill that void with something more meaningful and more rich than 
wokeism or scientism or stakeholder capitalism, the idea that you can satisfy your moral hunger by going to Ben and Jerry's and ordering a cup of ice cream with some social justice sprinkles on top, <laughs> not realizing that you don't satisfy a moral hunger with fast food. A moral hunger demands something more substantial, more substantial fare to fill that vacuum. I think that is the real work cut out ahead of us through our education system, through our culture more broadly. And I, I personally think we can partially fill that vacuum through a revival of our shared national identity itself, a national identity centered on that dream that I told you about at the very beginning, that idea that no matter who you are or where you came from or what your skin color is, that you can achieve anything you ever want with your own hard work, your own commitment, and your own dedication. And by the way, be free to speak your mind freely at every step of the way. That is the American dream. And I think that's what we're going to need to revive in order to defeat these cultural challenges. So thank you very much. And I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Thank you.